How much do we know about the past? We can answer that. Not as much as we like to think we do. There are gaps in our knowledge of the past of every country and continent in the world, so we constantly find ourselves looking for information to fill those gaps. Perhaps some of that information is right here in this video. The Tomio Maruyama is already one of the most famous Kofun burial mounds in Japan, and has been for a very long time. There are several established facts about the tomb, including that it was created during the late 4th century. It's the largest of all the Kofun burial mounds in Japan, which explains why it's taken archaeologists such a long time to fully excavate it. When they finally did so in January 2023, they came across something strange. A person buried at the very center of the tomb with an enormous bronze mirror and a seven-foot-long iron sword placed across their chest. Even the coffin that the deceased is buried in is unusually large, measuring just over 16 feet from top to bottom. Large mirrors have often been found inside the tombs of the elite in China, but this is the first time that such a discovery has happened in Japan. The artifact is shield-shaped and covered in interweaving patterns. Experts say the patterns are identical to a Kofun period mirror known as the Dariyukyo, and so they've named it the Dariyuman shield-shaped bronze mirror. It's not the most imaginative title, but at least it's accurate. Close to the village of Gantafta in Sweden is a large sandstone rock outcrop covered in carvings. They're known as the Slipranor Gantofta. For many years, it was thought that the markings were caused by nothing more remarkable than people sharpening their knives and axes on the rock, leaving behind long, deep grooves as they did so. Recently, though, experts have been reassessing the carvings, and they believe they've spotted something. They think the concave nature of these horizontal grooves might mean that they were made by a pendulum motion, similar to that of a rotating wheel. If that's the case, the markings were made with intent. Some Swedish historians believe that they might have had either magical or religious significance to the people who made them. It may also be significant that they're situated on the escarpment of the Ra River Valley. We know that the pitted ware culture lived in this part of Sweden around 5,000 years ago, but we can't be certain that the grooves were carved during this period. Some people think they can see faces in the stones, but that's probably just pareidolia. Not many people visit the Tassili Na'ajur National Park. That's understandable because it's in the Algerian part of the Sahara Desert. It's a rich hunting ground for archaeologists, though, and it's also the home of the Tassili mushroom figure. Historians and scientists are as sure as they can be that the mushroom figure was created during the Neolithic era. They're also as sure as they can be that they know what it represents. They think it's a depiction of a shaman partaking in hallucinogens, specifically the type known as magic mushrooms. If they're right, this is easily the oldest evidence of humans using mushrooms as a recreational drug in the world. Prehistoric rock art was first identified in this national park in the 1910s, but further discoveries were made in the 1930s and 1960s. There are other depictions of mushroom use in rock art, but none so striking as this one. Aside from being the oldest depiction of someone using magic mushrooms, it could also be one of the oldest anthropomorphic works of rock art in the world. If dragons have never existed, why did the ancient Greeks build houses for them? That might seem like a facetious question, but you'll find plenty of people in Greece who believe that these odd ruins found on the south side of the Greek island of Euboea truly were made to house the mythical beasts. The megalithic houses were made without the use of any mortar, with lentils and jams holding everything together. The sheer weight of the rocks pressed on top of each other like this ought to crush the doorway, but it doesn't. Scientists can't even work out how ancient builders managed to move the massive rocks into their current position in the first place. To compound the mystery, each dragon house is built at a high altitude and contains a circular roof opening. Presumably, that's how the dragons got in and out. The doorways must have been for their human visitors. Unusually for ancient Greece, no record of the construction of the dragon houses exists. We have no idea who built them, how they built them, or why they built them. 
No wonder the locals suspect that magical creatures were involved. Very little is known about Italian map maker Urbano Monte. We know he was born in Milan and that his parents were aristocrats. We presume that he had a very keen interest in travel and geography. If he didn't, he couldn't have come up with the enormous map that he's famous for. A map that displayed knowledge that someone from his time shouldn't have had. The colossal map, made of 60 individual sheets of paper and measuring 27 square feet when fully assembled, has the North Pole at its center, a perspective that nobody else would have used in 1587 when Monte completed his work and very few people use even today. His idea of Japan is a little off-kilter. It's positioned east to west rather than north to south, and yet it has accurate place names and locations marked on it that no other western map of the era featured. Monte had never been to Japan. We have no idea how he acquired that knowledge or why he felt so able to draw the earth as it might appear if he were hovering far above the North Pole when he was making his sketches. Mount Lura is both the northernmost point and the highest peak in the Futa Jalan Highland region of northern Guinea, with a height of over 5,100 feet. That's impressively tall. But that isn't the reason Mount Lura is in our video. Pay close attention to the shape of the rock at the highest point of the peak. Plenty of people say that it looks like a woman's face. Scientists will tell you that the rock has taken on this shape because of the effects of weathering over hundreds of thousands of years. But not everybody agrees. The face has been nicknamed Dame de Mali, named in honor of a small town not far from the mountain. She's perfectly positioned to overlook the forested gorges beneath her and is considered to be their guardian by those who believe that her features were carved by human hands. She's become one of the region's most important attractions for visitors, but isn't currently afforded any special protection. Without any such protection, erosion will eventually wipe her face off the mountain. The Musca people lived in Colombia before the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors. The brutality of the conquistadors led to the near destruction of the Musca culture, which means we don't understand as much about it as we'd like to. However, we know enough about the Musca calendar to admire it greatly. It's a surprisingly complex lunisolar calendar and recognizes three different types of years. The Musca recognized rural years, holy years, and common years. They divided the months up into periods of 30 days, and a common year was 20 months long. To the Musca, 20 was the perfect number, because it was equal to the number of fingers and toes. Rural years, on the other hand, lasted 12 months and followed the seasons much as our years do now. The holy year was 37 months long, and historians aren't quite sure why. Records of the calendar can be found on several Musca artifacts, including the Chochi Stone, several ceremonial flutes, textiles, and a large astronomical site called El Infiernito. At the start of each new holy year, the Musca performed a ceremony called the Jumping Toad. Regrettably, we have no idea what the ceremony involved. In 1389, a Jain businessman called Darna Shah claimed to have had a divine vision while in the village of Ranakpur in Rajasthan, India. In this vision, he was told to build a temple like no other in India. Not one to disobey the will of the gods, Darna Shah immediately began work on what would eventually become the Ranakpur Jain Temple, also known as the Chattamurka Daharna Vihara. He dedicated his temple to Adana, the first Tirthankar of the Avasarpini in Jain cosmology. It's now thought of as the biggest and most important Jain culture temple and contains several smaller temples within its footprint. It took Darna Shah and his team a very long time to complete their work. According to a copper place inscription inside the temple, it wasn't finished until 1436. Some sources say that additional construction work continued until 1496, by which time Darna Shah was long dead. The most beautiful and iconic artifact within the temple is a carved idol of Parshvanatha, made from a single slab of marble and decorated with more than a thousand snake heads. The intricacy of the work here would likely be impossible to replicate today. Latin is an ancient language. 
But how far back in history does it go? Well, we know that it goes back at least 2,700 years thanks to the existence of the Duenos inscription, which is one of the earliest known Old Latin texts ever discovered. It's inscribed in an unlikely place, along the sides of a trio of small vases known as a kernos. The vases and their puzzling inscription were found by the German archaeologist Heinrich Dressel in the valley of Quirinale close to Rome, Italy in 1880. Today, the Kurnos is held in the Stadtliche Museen in Berlin, Germany. Although it's usually possible to translate Old Latin, translating the Duenos inscription has thus far proved to be impossible. It doesn't help much that it was written without any spaces to separate individual words, nor that some of the letters can't be distinguished nor deduced by context. More than 50 different translations have been proposed since the artifact was found, most of which differ radically from each other and none of which have gained acceptance via consensus. Research is still ongoing, so maybe we'll decipher the message one day. We tend to think of Tutankhamun as the boy king of ancient Egypt because of his tender age, but Tutankhamun was old enough to have children of his own. We know that because we found two of them. Sadly, they didn't live very long. The children, both of whom were girls, were buried in their father's tomb and so were discovered when it was opened by Howard Carter in 1922. The inscriptions on their tiny coffins refer to them as the Osiris, meaning the deceased, so we don't even know their names. Somewhat inauspiciously, they're now known as Mummies 317A and 317B. The mother of the girls was probably Tutankhamun's wife, Ankhesenamun, who might be the mummy currently labeled KV-21A. Mummy 317A was born prematurely after only five or six months gestation, whereas 317B was born at or near full term. Their appearance is unusual, and while conditions like spina bifida and Sprengel's deformity have been suggested as possible causes, neither can be confirmed. In fact, scientists have never been able to determine what the cause of death was for either child. Many an ancient sarcophagus has been discovered in Ukraine over the years, but none quite so special as the sarcophagus of Prince Yaroslav the Wise. Part of the reason why he's known as the Wise is that he founded the first ever library in Ukraine inside St. Sophia's Cathedral in Kyiv, which is where he's now interred. The cathedral itself was built during his reign during the 12th century, and the sarcophagus has been there ever since. But his body is no longer there. It's believed that it was stolen during the Second World War, although nobody knows who stole it, why they stole it, or what happened to it afterwards. The sarcophagus is one of the few things inside the cathedral that's never been damaged or replaced as it was attacked and damaged several times in the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. By the 17th century, it needed to almost be completely reconstructed, with work beginning in the 1600s and continuing into the 1700s. The sarcophagus remained intact and untouched throughout the work. Today, the cathedral no longer functions as a church and is instead a museum of the religious history of Ukraine. If you thought that the hand grenade was an invention of the First or Second World War, we have news for you. To discover the origin of the hand grenade, you have to go back a lot further than the 20th century. Try the 7th century instead which is when Greek fire was used on the enemies of the Byzantine Empire. This ancient hand grenade isn't from the 7th century, it's from the 14th, but we've chosen it because it looks so much like the devices that are used in modern times. The clay grenade is acorn-shaped and even has a hole at the top for a fuse to be inserted. It would have been filled to the top with a flammable liquid and then hurled at enemy ships to cause as much damage as possible. This particular example was found off the coast of Israel in 2016 and is thought to be a leftover from the Crusades. The flammable liquid inside it was probably alcohol, so it wouldn't have been as destructive as the grenades of today, but it would still pose a huge risk to a wooden boat. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you'll be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching.